bit about me. Uh, my name is, uh, I go by Jess, actually. Um, so I worked for five years at SpaceX, which is an aerospace company in the United States, um, working on the Dragon spacecraft, and then on the data platform internally at SpaceX, and then uh, made the jump over to Netflix, where I work on the, uh, I'm a software engineer on the big data platform team at Netflix now. So uh, the big data platform, what does that actually mean? We've had a lot of talks today about how you can use data, the sort of insights you can get and how important that can be. But I'm gonna talk about kind of a different question, which is how do you actually let data scientists and data engineers get access to that data? Because that's a hard problem in and of itself, not just the math of getting your insights. Um, so Netflix has been around since 1997, actually, more than 20 years, and it's gone from this relatively small uh, company that will mail you DVDs, you can rent DVDs from them, to now a huge streaming company that is a quarter of the traffic on the internet and has over 100 million active subscribers around the world. Um, so that means that the data platform isn't just one thing. It actually is a ton of different tools and services and applications that have been built over the last 20 years to do different tasks. So a few examples of that, we have a specific service for tracking the metadata of our data. So figuring out where does the data belong, who is the responsible engineer for it, the lineage of data, so who's accessing what and when and why. Uh, a way to schedule jobs, so to have a script run every 24 hours and run the same analysis over and over, uh, things of that sort, many, many others, but just a few examples. Um, and that also means it's not just one type of thing. We've got all these different services that all work in very different ways, because they were developed by different teams at different times for different goals. So some are traditional REST APIs, where you send a request, you get back your data. Some are just raw databases, where the user needs to connect to the database, run a query, and get the data back uh, themselves. So many of the projects are open source, some are not, some are authenticated, some are not, some have metrics, some don't. There's really no common practice or, or common standard for all of these tools and services. So that means our data platform looks something like this. This is a, a small view of all of these projects are actually part of the big data platform right now. Um, so the question then becomes, how should users interact with this platform? Our users are the data engineers and data scientists and algorithm engineers, anyone at Netflix who wants to get access to the data so they can run an analysis. Um, so the easiest way to do this is you have a user who uh, comes along and they somehow on their own figure out that, okay, I want to run a query, run some SQL query, and then I want to schedule that query to run on every 24 hours or something. The user somehow figures out that, okay, these are the two services I need. Uh, they figure out how to interact with them to get back the, uh, to run the task they need to. Easy. From my perspective, working on the data platform team, that's no extra work for me at all. I can just go home. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not very easy for the user. This is a really flat model. The users uh, are completely responsible for everything. There's no interacting or intermediate layer between the user and the actual services that they want to interact with. But that burden is very high because then they have to figure out the authentication method, the, the way of actually interacting with those services. Um, it also means that we don't get consistent metrics and we don't get consistent authentication across all of these services. That actually becomes a huge deal when you don't get metrics on your services because you don't know what's in use and what's not. Uh, that makes it very difficult to deprecate old services that aren't needed anymore or to upgrade, uh, to add new things or upgrade services because you actually have to go to each individual user and either break their workflow, which they don't appreciate, or uh, help them upgrade on a case-by-case -case basis. It ends up being a lot more work than it's actually worth. So the problem then becomes the users don't want to have to go to a bunch of different places to uh, run their analyses. They want a single place where they can interact with all of the big data platform, all of these services. So then instead of this amalgam of, of different services and tools, you end up with a model more like this. This is the, the first solution that was built called the big data portal. Uh, so that was a UI, which was the portal itself, and then a Python library, uh, which is actually called Craggle, after the crazy glue in the Lego movie, uh, where the Craggle will have, has Python classes that each individual one 
uh, has the business logic for interacting with the underlying services. This is great for users because uh, if they want to use a UI, they can. They've got a single UI they can go to uh, to uh, interact with the data platform. Or if they want to programmatically do things, programmatically search for data or look at lineage or run jobs, they can just check out this Python library that's being used by the portal and run it themselves. Um, it's a more organized way. So this is a screenshot of what the actual big data portal looks like. Um, you can probably can't see, but across the top, there's different tabs that kind of correspond to some of the different services that we provide in the portal. So this actually works really great. Users have been very happy with this solution, um, but it also has some downsides. That Python library ends up being very, very complicated because it's got uh, individual classes for each of our services. Each of those classes has a bunch of random methods and additions uh, that users have requested over the years. Um, uh, you can only use Python, which is okay for most people. They can kind of pick up Python, but there are lots of people who want to use other things. They want to use R or Scala or Golang or Node or C++ or what have you. Um, and still adding and deprecating services is really hard because a bunch of users have checked out this Python library and have it running on their laptops or their VMs across the company. Um, because those li that library is still interacting directly with the services, uh, you still have to go out and make sure all those libraries get, uh, get updated if you want to deprecate or add anything. And then the most important problem that kind of arose from what we saw of the usage of the big data portal is that a lot of users, and especially in the UI, they don't necessarily care about one specific thing in the portal. They actually care about the interaction between different services. And they don't just, uh, they want to perform multiple tasks, all of which are interrelated. So this is a small example of what those relationships can look like. You have a user who will create some sort of scheduled job, something that runs every hour, every 24 hours. That job is responsible for writing data to a table or reading data from a table. So the job is related to the table. Then the table itself was also, at one point, created or owned by another user, maybe the same user, maybe someone different. But all these resources are interrelated. And these actually correspond to three different underlying services that are controlled by three different teams and accessed in three different ways. Um, so we decided that instead of just sticking with the portal model, we would just uh, make the attempt of writing an explicit model of the entire data platform as a graph, because these resources are so inherently connected already. So for that, we looked around at a few different uh, solutions that are on the market for graph APIs, and we decided on this technology called GraphQL. It's really the most prevalent one out there right now. Um, so GraphQL stands for a graph query language. Uh, it's actually a query language for your API, and it's a server-side uh, runtime for actually executing those queries that are coming into the API. Uh, GraphQL was created at Facebook. Uh, Facebook actually has one big graph for modeling their entire platform. Uh, and it's now being picked up by many other big companies. Uh, GitHub recently switched their entire public API to be all uh, based on GraphQL. So we know that it can handle the traffic of a big company with kind of the same data volume that Netflix might have. Um, so the killer feature of GraphQL is that it lets you explicitly write a schema for uh, the types, for the custom types in your platform and the relationships between those types in your schema. Uh, so your schema definition is a very clean definition of what your platform is, and then you have a separate set of code called resolvers that are responsible for fulfilling the definitions in that schema. This doesn't make sense right now. I'm going to show you an example in a minute that hopefully will clarify some things. So you've got your schema and your resolvers. And the other uh, useful thing about GraphQL, it's not the same as REST, where you might have a bunch of different endpoints that all uh, the users have to query different things to get different information. All of your queries are going through one single endpoint, uh, because you can now define the data you want inside of your request, instead of having to figure out what endpoints you're going to be going to. Right, so your model ends up looking something like this instead. Um, so you've got your GraphQL API with your defined schema and then the underlying resolvers that contain the business logic of how to connect to all the services. Um, and then the users can interact with the GraphQL API however they want, because it's just a generic web, web endpoint. So you can have a Scala app, the UI uses GraphQL the same way that any programmatic user does. A Python is still very common, but also people want to use Node. You can use really whatever you want. Um, great. 
So some of the benefits of this model, like the really big one, uh, in my opinion, is that we have a really clear model of what the entire platform is supposed to look like. It's not all encoded in kind of this mess of Python code that's grown organically over the years. Um, all of our metrics and authentication are in one place, so we know who is, exact, is asking for exactly what data and what services. Um, and because now there's this layer going between the users and the underlying services, users aren't directly asking like, okay, I need to talk to this specific service. They're writing a query that is then fulfilled by the resolvers. And if we want to change how that query is fulfilled, we can do that without any impact to users at all. And one thing that's not terribly obvious, but we've kind of found by building this API, is it actually is very helpful for our latency model. So we now have a really good view of what services are slower than others and why they're being slow. So again, when a user asks for uh, data on 10 tables and four other users and a bunch of jobs, we can see which part of that, uh, when we're resolving that schema, uh, what is being slow, and then we can push the caching and the latency investigation down to the underlying service that's exactly causing our problem. It's been really, really beneficial. It also has some drawbacks uh, with any technology. Uh, this is adding some complexity. It's adding an additional layer that's kind of weird if your users are used to REST or database endpoints. Uh, they will have to learn how to write uh, GraphQL queries, or you'll have to write them for them. This is a single point of failure, similar to what the big data portal is as well. Um, if you're sending all your users through one application, if that application goes down, your users can't get to anything anymore. Uh, and then someone does have to be responsible for graph management. So you, if you're defining this clean graph of what your platform looks like, someone has to be the person who is responsible for that graph and adding new things and removing old things. So it's definitely not needed for every use case, but it seemed uh, useful enough for our use case that we decided to give it a try. So let's go through a small example of how GraphQL would kind of work in the wild. This isn't real Netflix code, but this is a real workable example um, of actual code that kind of shows you what I'm getting at. So let's say we have a scheduled job that's running every hour, something like that, and uh, I, as a data engineer, want to make a change to that job. Um, so I want to know who cares about it, who's responsible for this job. So if we look back at our model of users related to jobs related to tables, there's going to be a user who is the creator for the job, so that person probably cares. But there's also tables that the job is reading and writing to. And those tables are also all owned by different users. So the people who care are going to be the job owner and the owners of the tables that are related to that job as well. Uh, so it's kind of a very graphical type uh, query. So we could just write some Python code to do this. It's not very difficult in and of itself, where you write one request to get data on the job from the underlying job service. Uh, then you loop through the tables related to that job that's hopefully in the JSON body, get the data for each individual table, and then grab the owners out of that. And at the end, you get uh, this list of owners. This is n plus one network queries on the part of the user. The user is actually running however many queries uh, as the number of tables that are related to that job. Um, this isn't using GraphQL at all. This is using the old model of users interacting directly with services. So we could do this, or we could take advantage of our graph uh, format, and we could actually construct a GraphQL query instead, see what that would look like. Uh, so first, we need to create our schema. So first, let's create a person type for our users. Uh, it's relatively simple. A person will have an ID that's maybe a username or, a or an email address. It'll have a list of jobs owned by that user, a list of tables owned by that user, and then maybe some other attributes, like the manager of that person. Um, then jobs, also pretty simple. You have a job which will have some unique ID. Uh, the owner of that job, we've got a reverse link going back to the owner, and then the list of tables that that job uh, interacts with. And then lastly, table, similarly, it has a unique ID, it has an owner who's responsible for it, and then the list of jobs that will access that table, because it could be more than one. So this is the query that we want to write that does basically the same thing as that Python code I showed you before. You query for a job with a specific ID, we'll say it's called job zero, uh, you've got your 
You want to query for the owner of the job and just get the ID for that owner. You don't care about any of the other stuff. Uh, you want to get uh, the list of tables associated with that job, get the owners for those tables, and get the ID for those owners only. So this query is going to give you exactly the list of IDs for owners of all the things that you care about and nothing else. So we're not quite done. We have to write our resolvers um, to fulfill what our actual schema is saying. So. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but a quick example of what resolvers look like. Let's look at the jobs. Say that you, I'm using a Node.js here, which is pretty common for GraphQL, but you could use another programming language if you wanted. Um, so you have a function job, which is going to be your query resolver for that uh, job query that we wrote earlier, which all it's doing is calling the underlying job service, get job function. Um, and then we define a job object that has an owner attribute. And that owner uh, method is going to be calling the person service, which just calls get person. And an example of what the job service might look like is, uh, in this case, all it's doing is calling a request, uh, calling a, a REST endpoint. Uh, but this could be querying a database or calling any arbitrary service that we want, or even returning a static string. And then the other resolvers and services would look similarly. Great, so now that we have our, our query and our resolvers, we can look at our response. Uh, we've got the data that comes back is symmetrical with the query that you've sent. So you get back the owner of the job itself is someone named O. Monroe, and then the list of owners of the tables, it looks like there are two tables related to this job, and they're owned by K. Pride and L. Kinney. Um, so you have exactly only the data that you asked for. Great. And this is exactly one call for the user. The user is not doing that n, those n plus one calls anymore. They only have to make one network request for the data that they need. Uh, we didn't have to write any additional code for them. We didn't have to write a custom Python function or anything. All of the logic is inherent in the resolvers that we've already written to fulfill our schema. And the user, again, is only getting exactly the data they asked for. They're not getting this huge JSON blob related to the job and then a bunch of huge JSON blobs also related to each individual table that they were asking for that you then have to pull the owners out of. So it actually uses much less bandwidth than uh, the traditional REST model would. Great. Uh, so the common complaint is, won't this make my app slower? Like adding this new technology with resolvers that are doing weird things and you can't quite tell. And like I said before, uh, if you're doing this right, not necessarily. Uh, the schema request, uh, the, the killer feature here is that they are just returning the small amount of data that the user asks for. The user has to be very explicit and intentional with what they need. We're not pulling back arbitrarily huge blobs of data. That actually ends up being much faster than the traditional model. And we get traceability on the user's requests, so we could see if the job service was being slow or if the table service was being slow. That would be obvious from our GraphQL resolver side. We could track down what the latency is. And that means that the biggest use case for GraphQL right now is actually UIs, because UIs generally know exactly the data that they need. They can construct that schema, uh, that request, and pull back just that data. Um, and mobile also uses this a lot, because they, again, uh, care a lot about bandwidth and speed of requests. Great. So uh, kind of in summary, uh, GraphQL is not necessarily useful for everything, but it is very useful for modeling complex systems with a lot of inherent relationships between the, re uh, the resources that you care about. Um, and if you do it right and don't just blindly jump into things, uh, it can actually end up being a, a much better experience for users and for the developers. So great. Uh, happy to take any questions. Yes, yeah, thank you. So th thank you, thank you very much for this talk. I, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. So uh, there's a lot of like uh, exciting stuff in there. I, I was wondering, you can maybe uh, tell me a little more about then the consistency stuff. So when you build that model, um, uh, how does it work? So does it like is something part of the consistency like dealt with automatically, or does there really need to be an advocate who, who takes care of? Uh, the consistency. So You're talking consistency of the graph itself? Yes, of the graph itself. That's the, that's the one hard part of GraphQL. You actually do need to be uh, pretty intentional about how you create your graph. Uh, mm -hmm. So that ends up usually being, you have a set of graph admins who are responsible for uh, knowing all the underlying services that you care about and modeling them in a reasonable way. Because it's not always going to be one-to-one -one of like, this, uh, this database has these fields, so we're going to exactly replicate that in the graph. Maybe you actually care about something high level that has a different set of fields. 
Um, so it's it's really the responsible of responsibility of the the person running the GraphQL application. And that's why GraphQL isn't necessarily needed for much simpler apps and smaller use cases, but it is useful if you've got a more complex scenario. Yeah, I was also like wondering, um, uh, like if you, if you do some uh, kind of reasoning over what kind of uh, scenarios it does, like, I mean, also trying to understand um, um, queries that people uh, want to resolve through that, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to learn something from, from this. Like, what actually people want to know through this? Uh, right, yeah, so uh, figuring out what users want as opposed to what they say they want or what already exists is a really hard problem across uh, all of technology. Yeah. Um, so uh, I didn't get into it at all in this talk, but there's a, a bunch of libraries that are used for um, tracking uh, individual GraphQL requests and seeing what exactly people are asking for down to the field level. So if you've got a table object with a bunch of different attributes on it, and it turns out three of those attributes are never used, you'll be able to look at all the GraphQL queries that have been made in your application and see no one's actually using those fields, so we might as well deprecate them. Uh, and then similarly, you can see uh, if there's uh, some really complicated request that's taking forever that a bunch of users are saying, then you can see that in your history, see what the long poles are, and say, okay, maybe there's a better way we could be modeling this. Um, and then you can reach out to the users who are running those requests and uh, add fields or deprecate fields as necessary to change the model. Oh, wow, so, so cool. So um, let's take some questions. Uh, so questions in the audience. Some questions. Uh, when I checked, I didn't have, yeah, I have in the app uh, a question asking, uh, do you use an set, set, sell serverless uh, approach with our GraphQL? Um, kind of, so we're using the internal Netflix. Uh, Netflix uh, does a lot of stuff to make development easier within Netflix, uh, including a bunch of open source libraries, but also um, this thing called Titus, which is basically Kubernetes, uh, just was started a little bit before <laughs> Kubernetes. Uh, so we lean very heavily into Titus and uh, s some of the internal Netflix tools for uh, running all of our applications. So if we needed to, we could SSH into the containers and do whatever we needed, but um, it's not the traditional serverless application of using uh, the external open source tools. So. Yeah, and uh, then I think uh, it would be also interesting to ask more about uh, the data science in Netflix in general. Like, what are actually the scenarios and topics? Um, like, what, what kind of data uh, are usually checked? And like, what are the questions that are most interesting? Right, so I'm not a great person to answer that question, because uh -huh. I, I actually came to Netflix through a, a different route. I, I studied computer science in college, and then went and worked in aerospace for several years and then came to Netflix. But I've always been uh, very software engineering oriented. I don't actually know that much about the data science, but I know how to build applications that users want to use um, and, and make things maintainable. Um, so in terms of how the actual data science works, I am learning <laughs> on the job. Uh, in terms of the actual questions being asked, uh, I don't want to get too, many, too much into specifics, but no, you can no, kind you of into yeah, it like, kind of. we want to, the, the goal of, of all of this is to help Netflix make data-driven decisions, business decisions. We want to figure out, uh, the term we always use is, what brings the most uh, user joy, like what inspires joy in people. Um, so figuring out, like, people really like watching the most recent season of Queer Eye, especially right after Christmas, after they've all gone home from their vacations. Like, that's useful data that then we can use to say, okay, maybe we're going to make more shows like this. Uh, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm also a software engineer, but I'm uh, mm -hmm. recently in data science, and I find it pretty exciting. Also, I think it actually helps being a software engineer in data science. You you look at things differently. Definitely. And and also, um, I mean, for example, I'm now looking into process mining. For example, it's mm -hmm. it's a different view of like looking into data. Uh, actually, um, kind of posting hypotheses and on the. On the, on the people behavior mm -hmm. within systems and saying, okay, do they diverge from my expectations of how they behave or mm -hmm. uh, like what are the anomalies? And this is actually uh, crucially important also for security because you can you can actually track down that there's something wrong happening, etc. Yeah. So uh, I think that actually the mindset of software engineering and data science that we look at different things, maybe bringing security in and bringing this yeah. one in. 
It's actually very healthy and very useful. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and about the, um, some questions from the audience. Um, I, I can talk forever, so. Um, <laughs> uh, but if, it, if there is some question from the audience, I can actually give you some space. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is over there, right at the back. Yes, waving. Uh. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, you talked about the user uh, throughout the talk when he uses the GraphQL, but you probably also meant uh, the applications, those would be users as well. And uh, I was curious, uh, would your data analyst uh, or data scientist, would, would they also use this GraphQL interface or would they go directly to some table to write a query that would be maybe um, optimal for whatever he needs to be, do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the idea of um, application access versus human access is actually a pretty big deal. Um, so applications don't necessarily always care about this graph. Sometimes an app just wants to talk specifically to this other service, and that's all they care about. And if that's what they want to do, that's totally fine. They can bypass GraphQL and go to the underlying service. Um, I think I also conflated a little bit what the word query means. So when I was talking about queries through most of this talk, I meant a query that a user is sending to the big data platform or the big data portal. There's also the meaning of query of a SQL query that you're sending to a specific table where you want to get back data. So if you're sending a specific query, uh, a SQL query, then uh, there's we don't actually handle that in GraphQL yet, but the goal is to eventually, yeah, still have that go through that front door, that GraphQL API. Um, but then all that's going to be doing is farming it out to the underlying uh, compute resources that will then run the SQL query directly. Uh, data transport is uh, a, a big um, big area that we're looking into right now. So, yeah, good question. Yes. Uh, some more questions from the audience. So I would maybe have a, a kind of closing question. I'm just curious myself. How difficult it is to get to Netflix or SpaceX through the interview? So how, do, how does it work? Like, I mean, uh, both companies, it's, yeah. is um, it very difficult? Yeah, so I kind of cheated my way into a SpaceX interview, I think. Um, I was, I, I've always loved space. My grandfather worked at NASA for 30 years, and I grew up in Houston. I've always been very, like, Spacey. So I came to college really wanting to be a mechanical engineer because uh, I wanted to get an engineering degree and then go work at NASA. I took one engineering class and just like hated it beyond <laughs> anything I'd ever done in my life. Um, so I kind of gave up on that and decided like, all right, I, I really like math, so I'm going to go into math and computer science instead. And then we had a career fair at my college where there was someone there who was, uh, there were a ton of recruiters, but someone was there recruiting for SpaceX looking for uh, engineers, not looking for software engineers, looking for um, electrical and uh, mechanical engineers. And I figured like, okay, well that's not my skill set, but I think SpaceX is cool. So I waited to, till the end of the career fair and then went and talked to the guy anyway. I was just like, yeah, you know, I think this is pretty dope. So um, <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, and he took, ended up taking my resume anyway and passed it to someone who passed it to someone who uh, gave me a phone screen and then offered me an internship from the phone screen. So wow. uh, there's a lesson in that. It's uh, go for things, even if you don't think you're qualified, because it might just work out. Um, yeah, and then uh, Netflix also, uh, the, the way I got into Netflix is honestly because uh, I knew a bunch of people at Netflix. Um, I was kind of burned out at SpaceX after five years, and I had heard uh, a bunch of my coworkers at SpaceX had actually recently gone to Netflix, and they were very happy there working on the data platform, uh, working on a similar set of tools. So I was still working on... Uh, data access tools for engineers. At SpaceX, it was for propulsion engineers, um, and at Netflix, it would have been for data engineers. Uh, but it was a similar set of problems, but entirely different, because the scale of data at Netflix is so huge. Like, I'm pretty sure a ton of you in the audience have Netflix accounts. Like, all of that feeds into the data platform at Netflix. Um, so I was really curious about that, emailed a few people, and uh, ended up getting through the interview process and, and getting a job. So, yeah, leaning into networking also is uh, unfortunately really helpful because I think it does impact the diversity of the workforce. If you are just relying on friends of friends of friends, it's a great way to have, like, 
90 white guys who all went to, went to Princeton, um, but it, it really is helpful in the real world. So good job coming to conferences and making connections, because this is the right way to do it. Yeah, and actually, I, I think that it, this is actually good as an invitation to uh, the lightning talks, because um, still maybe there are some free slots where you can just come up and uh, tell a bit of your story, and, and through that, uh, get you known to other people and actually uh, ask for some interaction after that. Uh, so um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you once again.